hockey camaraderie and chemistry and all that syrupy stuff can be dismissed very easily by a lot of people on the outside. Never, ever, ever by those on the inside. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates that I hope you'll check out. Penguins versus Panthers tonight, 7.08 p.m. is the face-off at PPG Paints Arena. I'll be covering it for DK Pittsburgh Sports, writing a full column and all that. I know you're all subscribed to our site and our app, so I don't have to bring that up, right? Right? And rather than getting all the ins and outs of how to shut down Alexander Barkov or the merits of being able to face the Panthers in the post-Frank Vetrano era... I'm going to share with you something that I picked up on on my trip to Ottawa last week to cover the Penguins. I think I've shared with you guys before that there's so much more information available on the road than there is at home. You have access to almost everybody. You don't have the sea of reporters and cameras and microphones that you have in Pittsburgh flooding around everybody who looks like they're ready to talk. It's just a much more relaxed open setting. And you know, to what I said in the intro, if this isn't your thing, feel free to tune out. But it is their thing. Very much so. I was told by someone I trust implicitly, who's been around the team for a long time, that this is the tightest group of Penguins since the Cup years. That these guys have each other's backs that they believe in each other, that they're friends, uh, that they've become like, I don't want to, you know, go overboard here, but like brothers, that it's become a really, really neat inside the room and in other parts of their little world culture. Now, even as I'm speaking, every syllable of what I just said to you, you were picturing some guy getting, uh, hit from behind and none of his teammates running to have his back and everything else that I was saying there, you were applying it to something on the ice. And it's totally fair. Uh, They are not some kind of rough, rugged, uh, gritty team. That's, in fact, been my number one criticism of this roster makeup throughout the season. Uh, I can't stand watching whatever passes for this team's third line. They're stealing, not not just stealing time from the team. They're stealing time from our lives. There's other things we could be doing with ourselves during third line shifts. But this is a different subject, and I hope you'll hear me out on it. Because when I hear from the people who are inside this team about this intangible, and then I see certain reactions on the ice to when things do go well, or when, for example, Chris Letang was bulldozed and Marcus Pedersen came to his defense, and I see how they play when they're playing well and somehow overcoming that third line or a rotten night from Brian Dumoulin or whoever, I appreciate all over again the value of this, because the truth is you don't win anything. You don't win anything in the playoffs without having this quality. It's the kind of thing, to be honest with you here, that makes a run like the one in 2017 possible. Yes, of course, the Penguins had two number one goaltenders. That was a freakish occurrence, and they took full advantage of it. First, Mark andre Fleury stealing what probably were the toughest series of that run, and then Matt Murray coming along later and finishing it off. But do you remember all the injuries? Do you remember guys playing with broken wrists and bones and Patrick Hornquist couldn't even close his own hand on the night that he scored the cup-winning goal in Nashville? Took his glove off and showed it to me. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But that's how... These things matter. They really do. And I liked hearing this. I did. It surprised me at least a little bit. Like I knew it was a I, I knew it was a good group, 
But to hear it from the inside, from this individual, it, it was different. And it made me kind of look at them differently the whole rest of that day and into the night, even through that goofy loss to the senators. And what I mean when I say that is I was thinking about what it is that they believe when they believe in each other. What do they see? I've learned a long time ago to trust the athletes whenever it comes to this sort of thing, especially when it's obviously off the record and not you know, something that's being spouted into a microphone. These guys know. They tend to know. And when I say these guys, I mean professional athletes what it is that they have. And they think they have something. I don't. You probably don't, based on the feedback that I get. But our votes don't count. And if they feel there's something at hand, something waiting to be tapped, something that's just waiting for guys to get healthy again, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right, and maybe it's worth staying open-minded to it. And that right there is as far as I'll go on the subject. Because if part of this is, well, Brock McGinn's a real glue guy for you, but Brock McGinn only shows up to play one of every 10 games, is that what it seems like to you? He, He certainly showed up in that rematch with Ottawa last week, but he'd been invisible for a month. Invisible. Completely gone. And if he's one of your glue guys, and actually I think he might be one of them, I'm not all that interested. Because you still have to be able to play. You still have to be able to uh, participate and contribute. So I'm just sharing this with you so that you can maybe go through the same spectrum of thoughts that I did in Ottawa. Figure out if it means anything at all to you. Figure out if there's anything that can be done within this current group to maintain that feeling, to turn it into something more meaningful than, hey, it's really fun to play chess with these guys on the charter flights home. And whether or not it's one of the many things that's keeping Ron Hextall from not doing a damn thing. When we come back, J1Q. from here who says DK seeing Jeff Petrie passing the way he did in Newark reminds me of your comments back in the preseason regarding how he's going to help this team he looks like the guy who could be bringing what we'd all hoped for you know what I found out that I appreciated Petrie more in his absence than in his presence I am not too proud to admit that I really liked where his game was heading right when the wrist was busted. Right around that time. Uh, He was getting onto a trajectory where he was making a big difference at both ends. And and here you mention the passing, and I'm going to presume that you're referring primarily to the outlets that he made. That's his thing. That's his thing. And that's been a big, big percentage of what's been missing for this team and some of these exasperating losses of late. The defensemen haven't done enough to get the forwards the puck. The forwards, in turn, didn't come back deep enough to make sure that they were available for those passes. Then when they do that, you lose the element of the long-term attack, the stretch passes and so forth, and it becomes multiply frustrating. Petrie makes that difference. I believe... Chris Letang will begin making that difference again very soon, maybe as early as tonight. Who knows? And it's just such a big factor. It's it's like, I don't know, is it cutting the head off the snake? Is that the right analogy? You know, the rest of the snake still wiggles for a little bit, but it doesn't get anything done. And then sooner rather than later, it's out of operation. The Penguins need their forwards to have the puck as quickly as possible. Their best players are their Top six forwards, their top two lines, but they don't mean a thing 
they can't hurt you at all if they don't have the puck and they're just out by the red line waiting for it. But this goes beyond that. I liked Petrie's game in the defensive zone, the way he was using his size in front of the net. Uh, He was being effective, I thought, in terms of penalty kill, keeping the puck out of the box area. Uh, very authoritative behind the Pittsburgh net in winning the puck and moving it up the boards. There's just a lot to like about this player. I'm going to repeat something now that you'd probably remember since you cited those references to last summer, but anybody who's new to the show might not be aware of. There was a time just a couple of years ago where over the first half of an NHL regular season, It had become consensus around the NHL that Petrie was a Norris Trophy candidate. Now, he faded somewhat over the course of that season in Montreal, but for a half of an NHL season, he was seen as one of the very best players at his position in the sport. And ask yourself how often that's happened in Pittsburgh, even with Latang. Even with Latang, he almost never comes up for the Norris. He's been amazingly consistent over his decade and a half in the league, but he's never been one of those top three, four guys, at least not someone who's routinely mentioned among them, whether that's fair or not. And Petrie was. So this is someone who's capable of playing at a very, very, very high level. He's... 36 years old now, so he's not that guy anymore, and he can't be that guy anymore, but he also doesn't have to be several notches down from that guy. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. (laughs) 